Right brain realism is the antithesis of the idea that any of us are only creative or analytical, and instead posits not that you can be both or should be both, but that you already are. We're going to look at not only the antiquated idea of right brain versus left brain, but challenge all the things we think we know about ourselves and how we think, learn, and communicate for a greater sense of balance in our lives, which will hopefully allow for a greater sense of self-awareness, purpose, and empathy, and offer practical methods to help us get a little closer to the people we want to become. Let's get to it. to you folks and welcome to another episode of right brain realism i'm your host as always austin j morris and i cannot tell you how excited i am about today's episode um there's a book called make it stick uh it's about the science of how we learn and how to retain the information that we learn um, and take it with us not just for the test we've got to take that week but through our lives and it's just one of the most incredible in works of research and incredibly presented works of research that, that really allows the reader to, to understand what's going on and understand the concepts. And I, uh, I think it's amazing that the book itself is a masterclass on its own ideas and principles. Uh, and I emailed uh, the website of the book itself, hoping that one of the three authors of the book might find the time to join me and I hit the jackpot and all three of these gentlemen uh, decided to, to join for the call today and I could not be more grateful, more excited to have uh, Mr. Peter Brown, Dr. Mark McDaniel and Dr. Henry Roddy Rodiger with us today. Uh, wonderful, welcome to the show guys, welcome to Right Brain Realism. Thank you so much for the research and the work that you've done and how you presented it to the world. I could not be happier to have you here today. Uh, how are you guys doing this morning? Good. Good. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to let these guys kind of introduce themselves for a moment, talk a little bit about who they are, where they're from, and how they got to this place today. Uh, how about we start with Mr. Peter Brown? Thank you, Austin. It's great to be on this uh, podcast. Uh, my uh, background is in uh, management consulting and writing. Uh, I retired from management consulting some years ago and have been uh, uh, publishing. Uh, I am uh, connected to uh, Mark and Roddy by uh, virtue of being Roddy's brother-in-law. And when I learned about the work that they had done uh, and the idea of putting out a book, we decided to collaborate. So that's how I got involved with these guys who are uh, deep into the science and uh, it's just been a remarkable experience to, to work with them. Oh, fantastic. Wonderful. Uh, so good to have you, Peter. That's such a cool story. I didn't realize you guys were brothers-in-law. You said the last time you saw each other was on Thanksgiving. Now it makes more sense. That's uh, that's <laughs> fantastic. Uh, Dr. Rodiger, how are you today? Good. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, the uh, I'm a professor at Washington University in St. Louis and have been studying learning and memory for the last 50 years uh, since graduate school. And so um, the book is an outgrowth of that, but as you mentioned, and I guess we'll talk about it later, there was especially a, an intense senior period of time when Mark and I and, and other people had funding through the James S. McDonald Foundation for applying cognitive psychology to education. And so that launched the project that we're all involved in and that helped us uh, craft the book. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, we, we will definitely be getting into that. I cannot wait to hear more about it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Rodiger. And Dr. Mark McDaniel, how are you this morning, sir? I'm very well, Austin. Thanks for having us on the show. I am uh, have been doing work in human learning and, and uh, memory for the past 45 years since graduate school, and I'm a professor in psychology at Washington University in St. Louis. And I also direct a center on... Uh, Integrative Research in Cognition, Learning, and Education. And one of our big pushes, Roddy and I, has been to take principles that have been honed and, and discovered in the laboratory and talk about how those principles might be translated into 
real world context, like educational context, business context, training context, to help people uh, get more out of their training, retain more, understand more. And, um, and with the help of Peter Brown, Ronnie and I had always thought this information would be good to bring to the general public, but we knew that if we wrote about it, it would probably be a little dry, a little academic. And so Peter Brown has turned this information into just uh, a very entertaining kind of story and make it stick, centered around lots of vignettes of people in sports, coaches in sports, business people, surgeons, and so on to illustrate the principles. And so thanks to Peter, this is a really, really readable, accessible book. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. That's uh, that's wonderful. So good to have you all here. And um, and it, what you just said, uh, Mark, is 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 absolutely true. It's it's it doesn't read like a textbook. At the end of the day, what it is is a, a culmination. It's a research paper that goes over not just ten years of of your study, but but what'd you just say, fifty and forty five years, ninety five years of combined uh, knowledge in the field of of memory and learning, and and it doesn't read as a, a stodgy textbook by any stretch it really is is stories and and um it, it's it opens with uh the story of a pilot uh going through a problem in in mid-flight and i i don't know if the listeners can't see this but i'm showing the tattoo of boeing 727 on the back of my right arm uh that i have in memory of my grandfather and so like from from page one i was hooked uh but even if you don't have a tattoo of an airplane you'll uh, <laughs> you, you will also be hooked from page one and um, believe it or not, it just gets better from there. Um, so yeah, let's get into a couple of um, uh, main points of uh, the, to the, to the meat of the episode, if you will. And um, Mark and Roddy, you both alluded to kind of this study you went through. Um, so let's talk about the, the funding that you got and what that study was, how you came together and how long you spent on that and those sorts of things. Uh, I know Dr. Rodiger, you were the principal investigator on, on that. Is that correct? So That's I'll let right. you kind of start talking about that if you'd like. Sure. Uh, uh, the McDonald Foundation, um, which is well now part of Boeing <laughs> uh, or the McDonald, some McDonald aircraft, James McDonald uh, left the money for this foundation and they have always been interested in education and they asked me to bring together a team uh, of eventually 11 people, counting me, who uh, spread around the country, cognitive psychologists who are taking an interest in education. And so what we tried to do, as Mark said, is to derive principles that would be applicable in the classroom. And so uh, we can talk about those principles in a moment, but we had 11 people we met once a year um, well, twice a year, but one time was uh, more informal. And then once a year, we got together and spent three days presenting our research to each other. And then that fostered a lot of collaborations and more research. Peter attended one of those meetings as we were just starting the book. And that kind of launched us on our way. So um, <clears throat> it was a great 10 years of research. It's still ongoing. Um, in many ways, uh, the, our students who we trained, who were supported by that grant, are now off on their own. And some of them actually have another grant from the McDonald Foundation to continue the research. So it's been a wonderful experience made possible by private philanthropy. And that helped. One thing they wanted to do was say, how can we disseminate this information to a really wide audience? And that's partly where the book came from. We said, well, we think if we uh, can write an accessible, interesting book that will help disseminate our research. And the book has done just uh, wonderfully well, uh, certainly um, exceeding what most books about learning would do. Maybe every book, in fact, about learning and memory would do because it sold so well, still in hardback six years later. Yeah, it's it's so well presented and, and, and such an easy read. Honestly, I... I... I would read it, and then over the last few days, I was kind of reviewing it to prepare for our time together today, and I was surprised at when I looked at how long the book was. I was surprised, because I remember it being such a short, quick, easy, fun read that when I realized it was about 300-something pages, I, I was astounded. It, it, it 
I've never read a book that or consumed a book that hungrily on such a high level topic. Usually uh, those those topics can be um, a little hard to, to get through. And uh, this one was just so wonderful to consume. So that's fantastic. Mark, uh, you want to talk about kind of the, the study a little bit and kind of how you got involved there as well and um, just add, add anything to? Well, I would, like to to add, uh, I would like to add something. And that is about during the same time period in parallel, Roddy and I and another colleague of ours at Washington University, Kathleen McDermott, had a grant from the Institute of Education Sciences. And that institute is funding well-designed experiments situated in the classrooms to test the principle that then illuminated in the laboratory. And our grant was directed at one of the major principles that Roddy and I have worked on, which is the idea that if you recall information from mind, that the act of recalling, the act of retrieval, how to submit that information and makes it retained over a long time period. And we think this retrieval to learn activity is maybe one of the most potent ways that all students and all people can learn. So we tested that out in the middle school and you mentioned to us prior to the show that you had taught in the middle school before. So you're aware of the kinds of students we're working with. We tested this out by implementing an experiment in which some information that students were learning in social studies and science were quizzed, no quizzes. Uh, that is, they weren't graded, they were just going through the exercise of recalling information from memory. We looked at whether quizzing that information would produce benefits on the children's exam performances relative to restudying the information, rereading it, or not being presented with the information in the classroom, again, for further study. And Austin, we found phenomenal effects. Every time we looked, we found big improvements in retention for the information that the children had practiced retrieving, practiced recalling, on no-stakes tests, quizzes, and, um, and this, the, the, the increases in scores improved their uh, percentage performance in something like a C plus 10A. They were really much better at using this information or retrieving it on their exams. And one exciting thing from our perspective is that it wasn't just rote memorization of the material. These quizzes help students apply the information to new situations. So if they were learning about the idea of competition in biology, you could ask them a question on a test about a competitive situation, say for food among species, and they would do better if they had been quizzed on previous days about the concept of competition. So this, th we think that this has really propelled uh, in the last six or seven years, embracing using retrieving as a learning device, not just as a way to get a dipstick into what people know. Man, that is so, so good. And um, gosh, that, honestly, it was kind of an overview of the book, the concepts, and, and the episode we're doing today, which uh, I'm chuckling at because the book it does kind of the same thing. It introduces all the concepts and then spends time going back and spacing and interleaving all of the concepts. So uh, Mark just did the exact thing we're going to talk about at the top of the episode and uh, uh, in just a natural way. So that's fantastic. So could I quickly add something, Austin? About please do. That Interrupt we, me always. Th there were some criticisms about this in the public venues about, well, what are we doing? The kids are already getting tested enough. Why are we testing the kids more? And it turns out that the, the middle school students enjoyed these no stakes quizzes. In fact, when our research assistants had to leave the classroom because their grant funding ran out, the children said, when are they going to come back and give us these little quizzes? We like them. And we looked at self-reported anxiety toward tests. And all these practice quizzes reduced the anxiety that students reported they felt about taking exams. Absolutely. Much to the contrary that we're over-testing students. When you think of testing as a learning activity, the students enjoy it. They love it. And they look forward to it. Yeah, you, you, you've almost taken the concept of testing and kind of turned it on its head where you're not learning 
to test, you're testing to learn. And I think that is just incredible. Um, especially like you said, for, for students, if, if the quiz, and for the record, guys, I'm going to say some things that I've taken from the book and some ideas that I thought I've gotten. If I mispresent any, misrepresent any of your findings or research, please correct me for the listeners. Uh, they tuned in to hear you guys more than me, that's for sure. But um, when, when quizzes are presented kind of as a game, uh, it can be more fun for the students. And we're not talking about testing. We're not talking about state standardized testing. We're talking about in the classroom, presenting information, letting them learn a lesson. And then later that day, again, later that week, and maybe even the next month, giving them a quiz on the information to allow them to recall the information on their own without rereading the chapter. Because when you reread the information, you're just kind of, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, going over the the same neural pathways, but when you recall the information on your own, you're building a new pathway and strengthening the pathways between what you've learned and what you've connected it to. And so presenting these, these quizzes is, is such, tests and quizzes have become such a buzzword in American education for good reason, for reasons that I understand. But when you present these quizzes as a way of learning and as a game, the kids can actually have fun with it. And then they're, they're learning on their own. And, and uh, I just love the concept of not teaching to test, but testing to teach. And I think it's fantastic. Um, if you look, uh, anybody who reads the book or doesn't can look in their own life at the experiences when they've taken an interest in something they weren't familiar with. It might be uh, uh, one, uh, some kind of a, a stunt bike or it might be a video game, could be any number of things. They'll see directly that the notion of uh, trying something and not succeeding, but getting some information, <laughs> try it a little different the next time, which is basically testing yourself to learn how to do this. So from the moment we go from crawling to walking, this is how we have all experienced learning. And one of the reasons why I resonated personally and felt validated in my learning by what the research shows about how learning works. One thing to maybe add to what you said, um, is that the, the, we can't quiz kids in the classroom, but if they go home and quiz themselves, it's just as effective if they use it as a tactic at home. And if you think back, at least the way I learned multiplication tables, you, you, know, you have three times four on one side of the card and you have 12 on the other. Well, uh, and you, know, you, you practice those or in my case, my mother practiced those um, many times until I had them down cold. And basically that's the same idea, except that it works for higher level learning as well as for multiplication tables. And so once people, I, I, we had a number of people as Mark said, I had one journalist said, what you're saying is completely counterintuitive to me. You know, we usually think we learn by reading and we express what we know on the test and this just turns everything on its head. Uh, that's true in that sense. Um, and usually, certainly when I was in college and even when I taught for many years, I thought of tests as kind of a nuisance. You know, you had to get them to give students grades, but they'd be much better off listening to me lecture. Well, obviously now we've turned that idea on its head too. You can learn an awful lot by taking a test, especially if you look up the answers that you didn't know. Uh, that would be a formal test, but practicing retrieval as a learning strategy, as you say, is uh, about as effective as anything we know that doesn't take a lot of, I mean, there are these fancy mnemonic devices that people use, but those take a lot of effort and you uh, have to use special techniques. This is something anybody can use. And so are uh, the other principles we talk about in the book, spacing, uh, spacing out your study and interleaving it with other things to study, not cramming everything at once. Yeah, in fact, that's fantastic. Let's, because um, I want to, I want to continue forward, but let's pause for a moment and just uh, kind of define a couple of the the ideas in the book, because we're we're going to be talking about these these words a lot. We've already used the word interleaving a few times, and I'm sure that there are people who don't um, necessarily aren't familiar with the concept. So, I, for the record, these guys present 
so many concepts in this book that again, really do run counterintuitive to how we learn and how we teach and how we're told that we learn and, and just what we've grown up with in Western education for who knows how long. Um, but three of the places I'd like to kind of focus on for today's episode, and these guys are welcome to come back on anytime they'd like to really get into to even more of them. But the three, and we, we've talked about these three already, are self-quizzing, um, to learn, um, interleaving, and spacing. So let's take just a moment and just kind of define those three things. We actually, have, have, I think we've done quite well talking about self-quizzing and that we can um, just use flashcards and go home and give ourselves quizzes and recall that information. Um, but Mark, how about you just tell everybody a little bit about what interleaving is and what it means and how we can apply that? Okay, well, interleaving means um, mixing up study of related concepts. So let's take, for example, different math calculations and let's consider you're trying to learn how to calculate the volume of different solids. The different solids are going to uh, require somewhat different calculations or formulas to uh, compute their volume. And typically in, I, I know at least in statistics in our university, we typically spend maybe a week on one kind of statistic, another week on another kind, a third week on a third kind, so let's think about that with regard to these volumes. You could imagine instructing how to compute the volume of a particular solid and give students practice on it. And students are going to get better. They feel, well, I really know this. And then you say, okay, good. We're ready to go on to the next volume. And we'll learn how to, next solid, and we'll learn how to compute the volume of that. And we'll spend a lot of time uh, massing study of that. Interleaving would say, no, instead, what you ought to do is you ought to, give a little bit of work on one kind of solid and uh, then interleave with work on another solid, a third solid interleave with work on that solid. And even though it may feel difficult for the learner, the idea is, is that this difficulty is going to stimulate the learner to do more work in figuring out what are the attributes of the solid that give rise to the particular computation for volume. So, to make this very concrete, a, a researcher at University of South Florida, Doug Rauer, did exactly this experiment where some students learned to compute the volume of the different solids in a mass fashion. They learned one volume, uh, one solid, then another, another. Other learners were given instruction on how to compute the volumes of the four solids, and then they practiced on all the problems interleaved, all intermixed. And at the end of the practice, the people who had the mass study were performing it about 85, 90% correct. And the people in the interleave practice were forming, performing it about 60% correct. So imagine what you're feeling as a learner in the mass study. You're feeling, I've got this, I've really learned this. And imagine what the instructor is feeling. The instructor is saying, I ought to get a teaching award. I mean, all my students are performing at 90%. But the, here's the catch, Austin. A week later, when you give the students a test. For the record, folks, if you've tuned out for a moment, if you're driving for this podcast and you're looking at the road, you need to pull over for this next point because Mark is about to bring it home in such a real way. <laughs> so a week later, you give students the same four volumes with slightly different parameters, different radius heights and so on. And it's stunning, Austin. The group given the mass practice, which is the way mostly we teach math, practice math in this country, dropped to 20% correct. The group given the intermix study, they were still at 60%. They didn't lose a thing. Now, you'd like to see them maybe get higher, but they just maybe... But that was a, hey, that was a tough concept, but... Yeah, it was a the, tough concept, the but they attention. didn't lose a thing. Everything they learned was hard-earned and was retained and was uh, able to be transferred to, to new parameters. Now, what's happening, Austin? Here's what's happening. When you mass these kinds of interrelated concepts, the student never has to learn what the, what the features are of this particular item that give rise to a particular formula, a particular categorization, particular painting style, say. So 
On the other hand, if you intermix, now the student has to start to figure out, ah, for this, this solid, I've got to use this formula. I see for this other solid, I got to use this other formula. So they're working to figure out which distinctive features, which features tell you which kind of response to give. And that's what we have to do in the real world, Austin. When you're learning your things, it wasn't the case that when you were thrown out in the real world, somebody said, oh, here's some masked problems on this principle, so just go and apply it. No, you had to figure out what principle to bring to mind. And when we mass instruction, we undermine, we completely undermine the opportunity for students to do that learning. Because and, most learning, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but most learning that, that is retained is actually achieved through connection. If we just memorize an idea on its own as a singular entity, as we often do with mass learning, like you're talking about, a singular entity can be lost and often is. Like these students went from 90 to 20. That's terrible. That is an, a, but when you take that idea and connect it to a bunch of other ideas, it becomes part of a woven fabric. And you, it's so much harder to lose because even if you don't remember this singular idea, you might remember two or three others that help you remember that idea. So learning something as, as its own idea, you might remember, if you learn 10 ideas all on their own, you might remember two of them later. But if you learn 10 ideas and then how they connect to each other, how they inform each other and why they're important to each other, remembering number one will help you remember number two, which will help you remember number seven, which will help you remember number 10. Um, I, I, I hope that I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, give these, the, the, these ideas to laymen. In fact, actually the, the solids and everything are, are fantastic um, illustration, especially because it's taken directly from an incredibly important study on the idea. Uh, but Peter, uh, as you did so well in the book, uh, you, you use a really great baseball analogy for the same idea. Peter, would you mind talking about interleaving and baseball? For the people who checked out when we started talking about chemistry and solids, let's get the sports fans back in the room uh, for, for how we can truly apply this idea, not just in a chemistry classroom, but in life and not just in sports, but, but in education. Peter, we'll talk about baseball a little bit with, with the interview. This was a study were. at Cal Poly uh, working with the baseball team. They're all pretty good hitters, but they did a study where they're gonna try to bring up their uh, batting success. And they were uh, practicing uh, fastballs, curveballs, and change-ups, if I recall correctly. And half the team uh, would uh, practice 15 fastballs, uh, and then they go on and uh, do 15 change-ups, and they go on and do 15 curveballs, and the practice went like that. The other rest of the team, the other half, would practice uh, 15 of each of these pitches, but they didn't know with each pitch which one they were getting. It's mixed, random order, interleaved, if you will. So uh, they, the first group uh, knew what they were getting, and they, got, they did very well in their uh, imp improvement of hitting. The second group didn't know what they were getting and they didn't do as well. But when it came after the study and they're tested in a real situation, uh, the second group that had practiced in random order uh, did much better than the first group. They had to be really good at identifying what this pitch is and recalling what the right thing to do is to hit it. And we got examples in, in surgery. I was talking with a Mayo Clinic uh, uh, neurosurgeon who said you might uh, practice getting certain tumors out of a person in the muscle mass, but if you're working in the brain, it's the same tumor. In the muscle mass, you go very carefully to uh, get a clear margin and all that in the brain. You've got to be very fast because you can't afford to have the time of all the bleeding going on. So it's a different problem. It looks the same, it's the same kind of tumor, but actually it's a different problem. So you have to learn to identify it and give the right solution. So across any field you can think of um, where you have these kinds of variances, uh, learning in that mixed way leads to better uh, ability later. It absolutely does. And, and it leads to better ability, but like, like Mark was saying, and I'm, I'm going to toss it to Roddy in a moment because I, I think he's going to really talk about um, bringing this point home. But at, at the end of that baseball practice, here, here's, what I, here's what I 
thought was mind blowing that I really want people to understand, especially teachers who are listening to this. At the end of your class, you know, the end of your, your lesson is not the time to know if your students actually learned anything. The time is a day later, a week later, a month later. So here's, here's what we need to realize is that at that baseball practice, the guys who knew that a fastball was coming and the guys who knew that a curveball was coming, those guys outpaced the other group in practice by a lot. They well outperformed the group. They felt pretty good about themselves. Yeah, they did. <laughs> but the players in a game situation, the players who did not know which pitch was coming, were much better hitters in a game situation because they had to break down all the little things, the minutia of the connection. If the pitcher is holding his hand this way in the glove, it might be a curveball because he's holding the ball a different way. If he's leaning back a little, all these things, as the ball is released, how is it spinning? All those things that you have to pay attention to to connect how these things are the same and diversify the, the differences of what's happening, those little minutia that you don't even realize necessarily that you're paying attention to as you're learning, the connections, uh, the crossover and the, the differences, that's how you take things with you and, and hold on to it. So you got to remember, life is not practice. Life is a game, man. Every day is game day. So you don't really want to learn something to be good at the end of practice. You want to learn something to the home run in the game. And uh, and that's the concept of interleaving. Uh, Roddy, I'm going to let you kind of wrap up the, the ideas of, of interleaving. I know you've got something to add here. Uh, well, the, um, I think mixing uh, interleaving is a big word. Um, mixing it up, as Mark said, uh, and as we say in the book, is a good way to think of it. Mix up your practice. And the other thing, going back to the baseball analogy, in the game, Pitchers don't want you to know what pitch they're throwing. So if you practice where you don't know what's coming, you're practicing like the game conditions. And so you can transfer much better from practice to the game if you've had uh, mixed up practice or interleave practice than if you've had what, frankly, is standard in baseball. I played for many years. You get, you know, as Peter said, 15 fastballs, 15 curveballs, 15 changeups, and so on. Um, and yeah, you can hit them if you know what's coming, but not being you able don't to know what's coming in a game. What's coming is the unless thing. you're the unless you're the Houston Astros. Anyway, sorry, other, sorry, I had to. I really had one to. One other important point about that, which is that if you've been practicing in this blocked or masked fashion, you have much higher confidence. You have a perception that you're much better than in fact you are. So often, when learning feels difficult, we think we're not getting it. Or when it feels easy, we think we're on top of it. And mm -hmm. in fact, the truth is, it's the other way around. Absolutely. Uh, this is a topic you talk about in the book quite a bit, is learning is supposed to be hard. Uh, the, uh, how did you put it? Learning easily is like writing in the sand. Yeah, it's easy to do, but it's going to be washed away in an instant. Um, and I just love that idea. Learning is supposed to be hard in the moment, the but that's okay because you retain it. And I think, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, obviously self-quizzing, interleaving, and spacing, and we'll talk about spacing in a moment, kind of all inform each other and that they go into to, to one big idea of how we, how we learn and can learn and how we can retain. Um, but the idea of learning being hard or learning being easy is, I think, where the idea of I'm just a bad test taker comes from because you're so confident on the day. I learned it. I knew it. It was easy. I got it. And then you get to the test. You don't remember it. And we talk about self quizzing and the idea of over testing. And, and I, I think one of the most common phrases I hear um, from learners, I heard it from my peers. I, I hear it from other educators. I hear it um, from students that I taught the, the sentence. I'm just a bad test taker. And it, it does make me chuckle a little bit, and I feel bad um, when I when I chuckle. But a comedian, I don't even remember who, somebody let me know when you're listening to it, uh, said, you mean the test? You're bad at the thing where you prove that you learned something? And I know that's oversimplifying it, but uh, you, mean, you mean that test, that that thing that you, uh, you let people know that you learned it? You're bad at that part? Maybe you just didn't learn it. Um, and he was making a joke. But what's funny is he hit the nail on the head, is that 
you didn't actually learn it. We feel like we do because if it's easy, we're very confident. If we know a fastball is coming, we're confident we can rock it. We knock it out of the park. But that's not what life is. And so being overconfident that you learn something leads to being a bad test taker. So these ideas not only are going to be good for just retaining information in life, but as an educator, if you're listening, you should remember we're not just teaching these kids to, to take the test or whatever. And we're certainly not just teaching these kids to learn the information today or remember the information today. We're, we're hoping, the I, I hope the idea is that we're teaching this information for them to take with them as long as they can. And these are some of the ideas that, that help you do that. And you can actually learn to be a good test taker and um, learn to be a good learner. Uh, the idea of intelligence, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking too long. I'm going to kick it back to you guys in just a moment. But the idea of intelligence, so often people think they're stupid, and they're not. They just haven't learned how to learn. And you can teach yourself how to learn. And uh, that's what these guys have done. And uh, now I'm waxing poetic about these three, these three gentlemen and the work they've done and the book they put out. But if you're a learner, uh, someone who wants to get better and, and someone who wants to learn about themselves or life or you're a teacher who doesn't understand why their students aren't testing well or um, if you're a performer. I, I, I like to say this this podcast, I think it's for everybody, but I've kind of built it just for people a little like me, uh, entertainers, educators, and entrepreneurs. So if you're an entertainer and uh, you're having a hard time learning lyrics uh, or, or your lines or whatever, all of these things, all of these concepts are things you can take with you. Um, Sorry, I, I, I went on for, for longer than I meant to because uh, these guys these guys are the ones with the, with the knowledge and the information. Um, we've talked about Austin, spacing a little bit as well. Yes, sir. Can I, can I follow up on that a little bit? Please do, yes. Peter's um, suggestion that a learner is going to feel like they haven't learned very much when they're interleaving. And um, I, I, I think that when we're talking to educators about the value of interleaving, that's one hurdle that we have to surmount, which is that their students are gonna feel like they're not learning very much and they're gonna feel like they're not a very good teacher. So I think the teachers have to understand they have to bring the student in as collaborators, essentially, and let the students know, I'm doing this for a reason. Doing this because you'll learn more, it's gonna feel effortful at first, and you may feel like you're not learning as much, but in fact, you're learning a lot, and we'll see that through the course of the semester. So I think it's important to get students to understand why they're being forced to do something that's difficult when they know it could be easier. And I, I'll, I'll say briefly that since the publication of the book, we've had a tremendous number of emails from instructors who have said, well, I, I wasn't sure it would work, but I tried interleaving in my course. We had emails from instructors teaching AP history and many correspondence with te people teaching ninth grade math in Canada, and they've rearrange their course so they're starting to interleave the topics. And Austin, they're finding tremendous success in how much the students are retaining and the pass rate on the AP exams and the retention of the material to next year's classes where many other students are doing very little evidence they even took the, the Algebra One course. So it, 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 it can be done, it works in the classroom, but it does take a teacher who understands the students are going to have to be talked to a little bit about what the challenges are with it. Especially if you're used to the old way, like this isn't an overnight change. These ideas are not things you implement today and all of a sudden tomorrow your students are, are hot shots. It's it, the, the idea is that it's slow and that it's patient and that learning takes time. Uh, I've been yeah. a, a little bit surprised myself. Uh, how many requests we get uh, to speak to faculty at all levels. I mean, I'm not surprised they want to dig into the book. What surprises me is we're not often very much to speak to students. And there's one uh, school, a private school in the Twin Cities, uh, where I was asked to speak also to, to students and parents. And I've learned later that the students are given, when they're given these quizzes, they kind of wink at each other and they say, it's retrieval practice. They know what's, <laughs> you know, they understand it. And uh, I just think that's profoundly important uh, to Mark's point about, it's a collaboration between the students and the instructors. Students yeah. need to understand how it works and why it's structured this way. 
And that's so good because um, there's a couple points that, that kind of go off of what you were just saying is the idea is it to frustrate the students and make them feel like they're not learning. You want them to know what they're doing and know the, the benefits of why it's taking so long. And last year when we did math, I was really good at it. I learned it real quick. But this year, it's, I'm, I'm having a harder time learning it. You know, you, you don't want to frustrate them. There's, a, there's a, um, a concept you talk about is the word, you use the word strive a lot. And I like that. Um, and the, the, the idea of, of striving with the intent to fail because you learn from your failures. So you're striving to fail to learn because the struggles in, in a lot of a lot of times, the struggles are how you form the strongest connections. Um, let's talk about spacing a little bit. Um, Roddy, I'm gonna let you, uh, unless you have anything to add about interleaving, I'm gonna let you talk about spacing and, and, and that concept and how we can apply that, not just in, the, in a classroom, but, but in our own lives as, a, as adults as well. Sure. Uh, well, spacing as the name implies, it, it's kind of tied into interleaving. The idea is if you have a period of time to learn something, let's say you, you're a college student and you have two hours this week to study two chapters in your textbook, um, and you could do that all together, just take two hours and sit down and read through the two chapters. Or let's say you could pick an hour on Monday and an hour on Thursday to do that. You'd be much better doing it space not massing it all together. You, so if it's two chapters of a history book, you could say, well, I really want to get through this on Monday, uh, read it all and just get through it. And, but you're much better off to space it. So spacing, uh, say if you're even reading the same chapter twice, you're much better off to space that because what spacing does, it helps uh, let the first learning that you've done consolidate a bit. Uh, and we also think we now know, uh, in fact, there's a lot of evidence since publication of the book that sleep helps learning consolidate. And so if you uh, face things out, you have a period of sleep uh, and then you learn it again or you learn something related, uh, you're much better off than if you learn it all at once. And the spacing effect has been known, it was first shown in 1885. So this has been around a long time, but it's still not applied that well in education, which is why we, uh, I mean, it is tied up. If you interleave, you're naturally, pretty naturally spacing uh, too. Uh, so the, the two concepts are tied together, but, uh, but even if you're studying exactly the same thing, you're better to do it a week apart than to read something twice. Mark has a study where people read chapters back to back, just read then reread. And there was really no benefit from rereading immediately afterwards. But if you space your rereading a week later or so, then you get benefits on a later test. That's amazing because like you said, reading it twice in a row, everyone feels like, oh I read it, got to review it right now and 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 retain. But there's there's almost no empirical evidence that that actually improves retention. Uh, you're just wasting time reading it the second time. However, if you read the same chapter a couple days later, especially if you self-quiz yourself on the chapter before you read it, which is such a cool idea that read a chapter and then wait two, three days a week or whatever, and then read it again. But before you read it again, give yourself a little quiz on what you remember from the first time you read it. Rather than reading it to inform yourself, try to recall the information, build those connections in your own mind, and then reread it and take note of the things you got wrong or you re didn't remember or whatever, and just kind of quiz yourself as you're reading the second time even. Um, just that that idea of, of testing yourself and of pushing yourself to learn and of, of trying to recall. And you know what? If you don't recall the information, that's fine, but try first and then go find the answer. Don't go find the answer and then tell yourself, oh yeah, I knew that. Because you, you may you probably didn't, because like uh, like Mark said earlier, you may know ninety percent ninety percent the first time, and then a week later you're going to be down to twenty. Um, studies have shown, and I think this is a statistic from your book that we forget almost immediately forget 
about 70% of what we read here and, and take in. We forget 70% of it with near immediacy. So if you go back and you quiz yourself, you can kind of just help that retention rate. And I just think it's fantastic. So spacing out, learning now and learning later. Uh, there's um, <clears throat> the idea of testing and, and A, lowering the stakes of tests in your class because you don't want people to, to feel frustrated and fail. The idea isn't to pass the test, uh, at least not at midterms. Maybe it is at the, the AP test. That The idea of that is to pass the test. But throughout the year, the idea doesn't have to be to pass the test. The idea is to, to test yourself and to do as well as you can. Um, Austin, I might just say quickly that- Yeah, go for it. So that that I, I think, again, in terms of bringing students in as collaborators, uh, even in my classes where, where I'm telling people about the benefits of retrieval, some students just don't like to have this learning activity, this retrieval practice labeled as a quiz. And so some- It is a buzzword, yeah. Yeah, some students said to me, I, why are we calling it a quiz? I don't, so I said, okay, let's call it a learning activity. So in my class, instead of quiz one, quiz two, quiz three, we have learning activity one, learning activity two. It's the same darn thing. <laughs> it's the same thing. Practice. It's Plus a- takes, but for them, it's more palatable. And it's more, mm-hmm. uh, they, they, there's more buy-in. When you when you emphasize this is a learning activity, it's not a test. It is yeah, a- right. It's the same thing. You're just changing the name yeah. for. They do this. They do this. Uh, this is a little out out of left field analogy, but they do this with fish sometimes when they when they have uh, a fish population that's over and they want people to eat it, but they don't want to eat it because it's got a weird name. They just change the name of the fish, and people are like, "Ooh, we should eat that." Like it's the same thing. If your kids don't want to take a quiz or take a ke- test, call it something else. If you think you're a bad test taker and you don't want to test yourself, call it something else. Um, especially with, I think this would be m- even more effective uh, with younger students and, and just calling it a game. But I don't know, man. There's uh, every every old people love Jeopardy just as much as as kids. So using trivia and and as a game and and recall as a as a fun activity rather than the pressure of a of a test or a quiz, just call it something else and test yourself and quiz yourself and quiz your students and call it whatever you need to call it for them to enjoy it. Um, great. So that's, we, we've kind of taken up the, uh, the bulk of this, of this episode, just kind of going over the three main ideas and, and um, that, that, that I took from this book. And um, so those are self quiz. Let's, let's, let's space it out and review here. Right? That was self quizzing. Um, which we've talked a lot about, interleaving, which is just mix it up. Just go from one to the other. Let those things inform each other rather than trying to memorize one thing and then another and then another. Learn them all at once and let them inform each other. And spacing where learn something and then come back to it. And then quiz yourself and then come back to it. Um, So those are kind of the three main things I wanted to kind of talk about today because those are kind of the three main things I took from the book. Um, But I'd like to let each of you kind of take one thing from the book that we haven't talked about today that you think is important um, and that people need to also take from it in addition to those concepts and stuff. And, uh, or, or, or if you just want to add on to anything we've talked about today, I'll, I'll give you each a, a couple minutes just to kind of really get into um, something that you've taken from this book and that you try to, try to um, impart with people and that you want people to take away. Um, let's start with uh, Peter. Let's start with you this time. Well, Austin, I think um, a really important point is that people are not really reliable at judging what they know and can do. They have a perception that they're bad at this, they're good at that. And uh, an important part of learning is like we say quiz, uh, that means you get it right or you get it wrong. If you say it's a learning activity, then you're thinking, oh, I'm going to take a few shots at this and probably learn it, but I won't probably be good at it when I get started. And you're less so, likely to be discouraged for getting it wrong. Yeah, well, exactly right. So learning isn't a right or wrong. It's a matter of constructing your own understanding of the material and beginning to relate it to what you already know and coming back to it again later and elaborating on it further. So uh, an important point is uh, not to trust your intuition, but to demonstrate what you know and can do uh, through uh, quizzes or other forms, going out on the ball field uh, and actually do it. And then uh, get some feedback, you want corrective feedback. In situations where errors are 
are uh, permissible, <laughs> not brain surgery. Uh, you want to go in and do what you can and get corrective feedback because uh, you learn better uh, if you get corrective feedback and you get a better sense of what you know and can do and how to keep moving up through your abilities. And and the idea of feedback that first of all, Peter, thank you. That's that's so good. But the idea of feedback also, you can give yourself feedback. You can you can quiz yourself and then or or try something new or try you know go to to push yourself and then if it fails take stock of your own uh, performance or your own ideas or whatever, and give yourself feedback. Really be conscious in the moment. Take a moment after you've done something to learn something. If you're not with someone like a teacher or, or a partner or whatever to, to give that feedback for you, give it to yourself. Um, really push yourself and, and, and take note of, of the growth that you've made and the mistakes that you've made and, uh, and then come back to them later, space it out. So that's fantastic. Uh, Mark, what's, what's something we haven't talked about today or something that we have talked about that you really want to want to get into a little deeper? Well, something we haven't talked about directly is that uh, you did bring it up though, Austin, is that learning involves building relations among concepts and building just understanding. And here's the rub, Austin, is that when you're new to an area, when you're a student taking chemistry for the first time or, or geography for the first time or so on, many of the concepts, you don't see how they're related. And to, to the student, the fresh student, they may seem somewhat arbitrary. And I, I, so one of the things that is uh, prominent in the book and that I think we have to, understand, have to uh, promote is that Instead of memorizing information because it seems arbitrary, try to build understanding of that information. Try to explain why certain things might relate to each other. And memory results from understanding. Building good understanding produces great memory. And I have a demonstration I do with students, administrators, teachers, where there's a series of sentences that uh, look like they're uh, conveying arbitrary relations between a particular kind of man and an action. So it's things like the hungry man got into the car, the brave man ran into the house. Well, uh, at first go, most people just try to memorize those. It is very difficult. They maybe retain about 30% of the sentences. Then I say, look, try to, try to build an explanation for why the hungry man got into the car. Well, if you think about it just a little bit, you say, well, the hungry man got into the car because he needed to go to McDonald's to get a sandwich or he needed to go to the grocery store. The brave man ran into the house because he wanted to save his cat from the fire. And once you start generating explanations, now memory falls right out of that. And a whole bunch of sentences that you self-explain are now remembered perfectly, whereas before a similar set of sentences you were struggling to remember. So sometimes when we do these demonstrations in high school classrooms, we found phenomenal effects. So one student who was struggling in math after the demonstration, he all of a sudden turned it around. He was making high Bs in the class. And the math teacher said, he talked to him, he said, what's turning around? He said, it's that demonstration we did with these sentences. And I finally, I get it. I need to listen to the explanations that are being offered in class. And I need to relate what we're learning about to things I already know. And he said, that one idea, completely changed the way the student oriented toward his class and the way he, he was learning. So I think that's a big idea. Big idea is we have to explain, we have to generate understanding, and that leads to learning. Absolutely. I love that. If a concept is arbitrary, there's nothing to connect it to in our own self. It seems it's not just arbitrary connecting... to the students. Yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah. And it's not just connecting concepts to each other. It's connecting them to ourselves and making them mm -hmm. personal. Um, mm -hmm. There's a there's a idea in sales. A confused mind always says no. Well, I think it's very similar in in um, learning. A confused mind is just going to leave it. They don't. They're not going to take it with you. Uh, and I, this might be a little selfish. This might be me getting back at some teachers. But uh, <laughs> I always was the kid who would raise his hand and say, "When are we going to use this?" Um, and and I do think it's important. And sometimes I was doing it just to be just to be a brat. Uh, sometimes I, I, I was just trying to be disruptive. But uh, often it was, it really truly is. Yeah, but if I'm not going to use this, why, why do I need to learn it? And that, that connection and, and, and giving it to the students and, and giving them an illustration that they can retain or apply to their own lives or apply it to a future situation that they can actually see themselves in 
will also create that connection for them to form and take it take it with them uh, later. Uh, my 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 nephew was trying to learn math and he didn't like it. And he hated it. And then the next day he he was outside. And he built like this swing on the jungle gym. He took a jump rope and he tied it to the right places and he had the swing. And I said, do you realize that what you just did was, was you built something? And he's like, yeah, do you, do you like building things? Yeah, I love building things. And uh, he's, he was seven at the time, I think. I love building things. Well, do you know that building things is, is, is math? You need math to build things? What? And it blew his mind. I said, yeah, every building you see, there's, there's so much math. You need to learn math if you want to build things like that. And the next day he walked in because uh, my mom's a, a teacher and she was teaching him over the summer and stuff. And the next day he walked in and goes, hey, can we start with math today? And my heart exploded. It, it really did because you just got to connect it with them. And, and teachers, and, and again, I'm not Mark said earlier that I taught, uh, I was in the classroom, I substitute taught and stuff. Uh, and I, I had a couple longer assignments and stuff. I wasn't actually a teacher. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the case could be made. I wasn't even a very good sub. I think I, I tried. Anyway, the point is, um, I, I don't want to put myself in a teacher's shoes too much, but just I come from a family of teachers. And um, it seems that so many teachers can get caught up in how much there is to do and how much there is to learn, and how much is going to be on that end of year test, and our school's funding is on the test, and the standardized test, if my kids don't perform, then I'm going to get fired, uh, and you, you get so caught up in, in throwing this information at the kids. I think it's important to take a breath and just say, hey, let's take a day to review what we learned last week. Let's take a day to let these kids know why these concepts are important and why they're fun and why they might use them. Take a day to let that kid know, because I raised my hand and asked, when are we going to use this in real life? But I guarantee every student in the room was thinking it. And I don't think it's a problem to take that moment, take that beat, take that breath and connect it for these kids. Um, because you might feel like you're taking a step back by reviewing what you learned last week. You feel like you're taking a step back and you got to push forward. There's so much we got to get done this year. But taking that step back and reviewing last week, spacing that out, interleaving these concepts and saying, hey, remember what we learned last week? It connects to this and here's why. Taking a day or, or an hour each week to go backwards will actually push your students so much farther forward, especially when you get to those end of year tests. Um, at least that's my two cents, but let's kick it to, uh, to another doctor who, who knows more about it than me. Mr. Uh, doctor, uh, Roddy Rodiger, what's, uh, what's something else that you'd like to kind of wrap up today's with a concept we haven't talked about or something that you really, really love about what we have well, talked um, about? Let me give you an experience. I teach a uh, freshman first year seminar at Washington University that will be starting up in a couple of weeks. And we read Make It Sick in that seminar. It's called uh, seminars, uh, memory studies, and we read the book, we read two other books too, uh, and the students often come back and tell me in later uh, semesters, boy, this really helped me. You know, having that my first year in college, why didn't somebody tell me this in high, in high school? Why didn't somebody tell me this in middle school? And it's a good question that we expect students, Mark uses the analogy uh, in talks that it's like with, uh, with education, we throw kids into the deep end without teaching them how to swim. Um, why not teach children how to learn in third, fourth, fifth grade? Why not have, at the beginning of every school year, a little review session, say, here are some good tips for how you would learn the information? Because we don't do that. We expect them to learn, but we don't tell them how. And so one thing I think our book is good at is telling students how to learn. And I've given talks uh, to older adult groups in the St. Louis area. Everybody, older adults, was worried about their memory and stuff. And one man came up to me afterwards and said, I wish somebody had told me this stuff, given me this talk before I went to college. Maybe I'd remember some of that. <laughs> and so I think uh, one thing to emphasize is trying to get uh, knowledge to children as early as you can. And the other thing I would emphasize is uh, something we've touched on is basically stories or narratives that what we remember really well are concrete events, um, 
if we can form something into a mental picture, we remember it better. If we can make it into a story somehow, that's why in learning history, uh, a lot of professors choose storytelling, emphasizing certain points about the history of whatever era it is that they're doing. And so stories are something, narrative is very something that's very natural to the human mind that we uh, seem to have cognitively evolved to tell each other stories. And um, yeah, yeah, a, a student is much more likely to remember the plot of Avengers than what he learned in class that day. That is absolutely true. So and I think learning one through thing storytelling that makes my book stand out among books of uh, about learning, of which there are many, is the stories that Peter interwove into the book. That really makes so it stand out. And if you can remember that story, you'll remember the principle that's involved, and you can apply that. Well, it's, it's, it's great. Dale Carnegie does the same thing in, in How to Win Friends and Influence People, and it's why it's become such a seminal uh, book for so many people. And, and I think you guys have, have all three of you have, have added a book into the, the legacy of that, of, of just an amazing book that everyone really needs to read. Um, I truly, there's not many books I recommend to everybody all the time, and, and this is absolutely one of them. How to Win Friends and Influence People, Outliers, The Stories of Success, which is another book that kind of turns a lot of um, concepts on its head. And, and this one is one that I truly think can help everyone, not just teachers. If you're a teacher, this should be required reading. If you're a professor in college teaching teachers, make them read it. Um, if you're a teacher and just want to be better, read it. If you're an adult who just wants to be better, read it. If you're a, a business exec that wants to understand why you're training these, these people to come into your company and they're not really retaining, read this book. Um, and if you're a parent of students, please read this book and, and help review and self-quiz or give your kids review activities at home, get involved in their education and help them. Um, and, and be a part of it. And, and I promise these stories are so fantastic that if you're a parent who doesn't know how to help your student, uh, read this book and, and, and you will. Uh, if you wanna be an active part of your child's education, but you're not, just not really sure where to start, uh, especially if you weren't a good student and they're in middle school and you don't remember geometry either, it doesn't matter. Read this book and it'll give you the tools you need to, to, to be a part of it. And like you said, bring the, the kids in as an active participant in, in their own learning. As soon as your kid is old enough to read a 300 page book about, about learning uh, ideas and, and principles, um, give it to them. And again, this book is, is very narrative based. It's a story, it's story after story after story. And you learn from the principles of the stories, not just the statistics and the research that, that um, Mark and Roddy have, have spent their lives devoted to, um, but you learn from the stories. And um, that's just such an amazing idea that these gentlemen have brought to us and um, such a gift that they've, they've given to, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm waxing poetic because I have so much respect for you guys, but this book and this research and the way it's presented uh, all together is truly a gift to, to the world and to, to the world of education and, and to the world of self-improvement. And um, I just cannot recommend this book, these ideas and these men any higher than, um, then I, I honestly don't have the words to do it. I, I really don't. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna run into uh, the the end of show questions that I give to everybody, but not before I say thank you one more time to these three gentlemen, um, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll wrap it up in a moment, guys. Uh, any closing thoughts before we head into the the final chapter, the fun chapter of the episode? Absolutely. Absolutely, guys. I, again, I, I, I am floored. I'm flabbergasted that all three of you agreed to be on the show. I was, I was crossing my fingers for one. And so uh, I'm just, just really, really happy and really, really grateful. Uh, you guys are welcome back anytime, by the way. But the, an hour is not enough time to talk about all this stuff. Um, but uh, pick up the book and then we'll start there. Um, before we wrap it up, just rapid fire some questions. There it is. There's the book. Make it stick. That's what it looks like. Uh, the science of successful learning. Make it stick. The science of successful learning. Pick it up. Um, just rapid fire here, guys. Uh, I honestly, sometimes I send these questions out a few minutes before the episode so people can be thinking. I don't think I've actually sent these to you. Uh, so rapid fire. Whoever has the first answer, go for them. Let's just spend a little time having a little fun at the end of the episode. If you had a time machine, fellas, 
And you could go back and witness one event from history. You can't change anything. You just get to be a fly on the wall, witness the moment, feel the energy of, of, of what's around you. Where would you go? What would you want to see and why? I'd go to Gettysburg and uh, hear Lincoln deliver his address. Oh my gosh, that's a great answer. Absolutely be at the Gettysburg address. Mark? Well, I, I, I think uh, Peter primed me a little bit, but um, I, I'd, I'd love to be in on Lincoln's cabinet meetings because from what I understand, he had a lot of people who opposed him initially and had very diverse views. And I'd love to see how Lincoln took these diverse views from very smart people and wove them into his policies as an action. It, it seems so important to me, and I don't see that much of that in today's politics, but to allow diverse views to be presented and to be uh, inform and informed policy. I would love to have seen how those meetings ran. Yeah, that would be an absolute lesson on, on leadership and yeah. uh, compromise in, in, an, in an ethical way that, oh, bringing great answers today, fellas. Roddy, where would you go? Um, well, there's so many places. Um, one thing I think would be an awful lot of fun to be in the theater where Shakespeare's plays were originally produced. <laughs> oh, yeah. To sit in the audience and to watch <laughs> and see the audience react and um, and just hear the language that was used. Yeah, just be in the Globe, the original. Uh, see Shakespeare on stage. He was an actor. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, such a beautiful answer, especially for for uh, for writers and and researchers. Uh, the just the beauty of the language uh, to be there and, and experience that would be amazing. Uh, question two, rapid fire. What is one thing you wish had never been invented? <laughs> I hate to say it, but I'm not feeling too good about social media these days. <laughs> that You are not the first person to give that answer, Peter. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful tool when used correctly, but it, it can get out of hand quick, can't it? I guess um, atomic weapons. Yeah. Absolutely. I, and you know what? I think I think... Oppenheimer would probably uh, agree with you. So um, yeah, absolutely. Thus I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. It's uh, it's absolute terrifying to, to, to think about what you did. Nobel, the dynamite, I mean, again, not atomic, but um, it's, it's such a great story that uh, he read his obituary that was accidentally published before he died. And he read all the things that people were, were saying about him and that he was a, he was a merchant of, of death. And, and that's what <clears throat> motivated him to, to establish the Nobel Prize is, is uh, he wanted something, his name to live on, not just about destruction. And uh, I think that's just a fantastic way to look at, look at things is if, if, if I had to read my obituary on accident, uh, what would it say and would I be happy with it? So that's fantastic. Uh, Mark, what do you wish had never been invented? Well, atomic weapons came to my mind as well. And uh, right now, at this particular point in time, being so close to Los Alamos, uh, it's, uh, it's very salient to me. But the, of course, the atomic bomb was invented. COVID-19 is another good one. <laughs> yeah, all right. yeah, that's, oh, that's, that's the same, Roddy. COVID-19 <laughs> is one reason why we're all available for, the, for this interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a new podcast host, I got to say, people's availability <laughs> right now is fantastic for me. So... <laughs> Uh, guys, uh, what is, and I, I can't wait to hear you guys' response on this. What is one book other than Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning? What is one book uh, that you've read that has had an impact on your life that you want to encourage people to read after they're done with Make It Stick? It's hard to narrow things down to one book. Um, you would not be the first person to give to. Well, I kind of want to give a, how about authors we would like people to read? I think- You answer this question however you'd like. Mark, most of what Mark Twain wrote, and I would encourage people to read Mark Twain, at least for Americans. Absolutely, absolutely. Peter. Oh, uh, 
I would I, I would say on becoming a novelist uh, by John Gardner certainly has had an impact in my uh, uh, writing career, uh, starting early on. Um, but two books that I, I have found uh, that increased my awareness uh, is um, the Oregon Trail by Francis Parkman, who went out in uh, I think it was the 1840s. Uh, from the East Coast and went and lived among the Indians. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic account uh, of what life was like uh, in those days and how the Indians were living. And then uh, following that with a book called The Long Death by a writer named Ralph Andrus. And it's about uh, the eradication or, uh, of the Plains Indians starting with uh, the uh, Dakota US war in Minnesota going all the way around Wounded Knee. And it's a, a stunning uh, book uh, for increasing a person's awareness of the situation uh, between whites and Indians. And I would highly recommend it to people. Absolutely, The Long Death. Oh gosh, it's, uh, it sounds more grim than exciting, but it also sounds very important. Sitting in, in Oklahoma, the, literally named the land of the red man that um that's definitely a book i'll have to have to check out that's a uh, fantastic thanks so much peter mark uh well i, I have a similar theme as peter uh, one book that i'm um, just reading now is called the killers of the flower moon and also yeah oh yeah and, scorsese and, a, and dicaprio are about to shoot that uh, in oklahoma they were supposed uh, to be oh, shooting it now but is that yeah. right and just a an amazing and astonishing account really of um uh, of just the, uh, the, the the dominant majority uh, 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 behaviors and actions toward other people, and uh, and also uh, it, it's quite a, an interesting account of how the FBI kind of came into being. And uh, second, so, second side, it's a great book. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then on a related theme, as Peter's, I, I don't remember the full title, but it has something to do about the Comanche moon. And it's about, uh, remember that title? What is that, Peter? I can't pick it up. Uh, up into uh, the Comanche moon. Yeah. Yeah. At Comanche any rate. It's on the Texas Rangers. Yes, exactly. And uh, another uh, great book uh, of just about uh, to get a, a point of view that's so different from uh, what we're raised in in the majority uh, framework and so on, a different point of view and appreciation for a completely different way of life and an honorable way of life and a, and a very, uh, in some ways, uh, you know, a, a very ecological way of life. And I, I think it just opens up perspective and different viewpoints and different appreciations of things that maybe we, we haven't recognized and, and uh, valued so much. That sounds amazing. Oh, those are fantastic. Uh, for those of you listening, I will obviously be be linking Make It Stick in the um, the description, uh, but I'll also link uh, each of these books if you if you want to check those out because uh, th those are some amazing read reading rainbow worthy book summaries. I definitely want to get those get to those. Um, I like to ask a question here that I that I tailor to to each guest. Um, so here's going to be the one for you guys. <clears throat> if you had thirty seconds with a room full of teachers and students, and you needed to give them one thing that, that you thought would really help them um, as an idea. Uh, one idea, you got 10 to 30 seconds with a room full of teachers and students. Um, what are you gonna let them know? Uh, Roddy, I'll let you start this one. Okay, I guess I'll give them my 30 second spiel. Um, tell them that they should think of, uh, they usually think of learning as getting information into their students' heads. They should also think about learning as getting the information out, having students express the knowledge they have because that will help them remember it uh, for the long term. And so practice uh, getting the information out of the heads as much as getting it in. And in fact, you'll be getting it in more if you practice getting it out. That's so fantastic. That was so to... practice getting, not just getting the information into the student's heads, but getting it out. Oh, I absolutely love that. Uh, Mark, you got 30 seconds to- I would say, I, I guess I would say that uh, one of the key uh, 
things that they can do to learn is to try to build understanding. And so the idea is not to memorize information, the idea is to understand information and to do things to build that understanding. You try to explain things to yourself. Try to teach somebody else what you're learning. That's a great way to build understanding. So I learned good. psychology when I had to teach it than I did when I was a student trying to learn it. Um, so the, the key is, is to reach for understanding, work for understanding, build, uh, build organization. That's and fantastic. And that's actually another topic we, we didn't talk about much today was the topic or the, the idea of elaboration to learn. And that is to just um, explain it to yourself in your own words, like read something and then explain it to yourself. And, and you're absolutely right, is the best way to learn something is to teach someone else. That's an idea that's been around for, for a long time. And um, very good. So when you learn something, when you read something, find someone on the street and tell them what you just learned and uh, you will retain it. Uh, they, they're going to think you're crazy, but it's fine. You're going to remember uh, what you learned a lot better. Um, that's fantastic. And Peter, what would you like to leave teachers and students with today? Yeah, I think that it's important for students to understand uh, the arc of the course or the subject, what, where we're headed, what we've been do a reach back, recall that, here's what we're doing now uh, toward this thing we're trying to accomplish. And then in the now period, in, instead of lecturing uh, or videos, uh, engage students in exercises of figuring it out as Mark says, giving each other feedback, uh, a, a sort of a skunk works, if you will, in the classroom that lead to better understanding uh, and and the retention. So good, fellas. So good. Um, the last, the last of my of my main questions, and then I'm gonna have us end with um, the point I that really led me to to reach out about this episode. Um, but what is something that each of you have learned in the, the craziness of of 2020 that you really want to remember to take with you once we're we're through all this and life starts to look a little more air quote normal. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is that uh, I am uh, extremely fortunate that I can go into uh, this sort of uh, sequestered period of time uh, and with someone that I love and in whose company I enjoy and uh, in a, a, a place where I can get the food I need and I can recreate by, you know, fixing up my nest or what have you. Uh, I don't think I've ever felt as fortunate uh, as I do at this moment in uh, grieving for uh, the, the millions and millions of people who don't have what they need. Yeah, uh, taking an attitude of gratitude throughout and, and just remember that, that when everything went, went to crap, that, um, the, that I was taken care of and that, that, I, that I got through it and that I was quite fortunate and just the gratitude and the empathy that goes along with that idea is absolutely uh, incredible to take to take with us roddy mark <clears throat> i'm uh, i guess one thing that surprises me i mean i feel the same gratitude peter does and he's living with my sister of course so that's very happy <laughs> and uh so um i think one other thing is that i've been surprised at um, how, I mean, I, I missed all kinds of travel this summer. I missed all kinds of things we were planning, my wife and I were planning to do. Um, but I'm surprised at how it didn't bother me as much as I expected. I adapted to it, um, sitting in the house every day, Zooming occasionally, but reading and doing my work. And um, I would have thought I felt would have thought, thought I felt a greater sense of loss, uh, not being able to travel and whatnot. But uh, I think part of it is watching how awful other people have it and then feeling how we're so comparatively lucky if we're something like a university professor. I'm teaching online this fall. Um, and so I guess going back to the gratitude and how um, it, it didn't, you know, I always thought if you told me, oh, you got to spend a year doing nothing but walking your dog. That will be your excitement for the day, getting out of the house. <laughs> uh, I always thought, oh, God, that sounds like being in prison. But it's really not. 
I'm really it, awesome. Yeah, it allows us to to appreciate the little things. And uh, yeah. and as you go through, and when a year, two years, five years from now, when you get to to walk your dog, I think I think or do any of those activities, I think a lot of us will think back to this time and and remember yeah. how how beautiful those moments are. You know, a walk. A, Walking your dog in the park is 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 beautiful, and I think uh, a lot of us can forget that. Also, and, um, appreciating uh, now that I'm home every day, but walking, you appreciate the change of the seasons. I think I saw trees differently, I saw birds differently, all the all the things that usually I'm rushing by to walk the dog to get to work, but now I'm I'm, I'm walking with a different different feel, different purpose. Yeah. Yeah, nice little reminder to slow down and 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 remember that the life is has beauty and and that that each day is is important and that there are really cool things around us if we if we take the time to look and um and really remember them and uh, that's fantastic, Mark. Well, I obviously well, maybe not obviously, but I, I heartily second what Roddy and Peter have said is that just so appreciative for and uh, and I'm. So grateful for the things I have and that I'm able to get through this without a lot of extreme suffering. But one thing I've noticed that uh, I, I think is very interesting is somewhat of a paradox. In this time when maybe we're, we're supposed to be isolating ourselves and so on, I see more people getting out in the neighborhood and walking, families walking together. So parents and their daughters, uh, uh, parents and their sons, the whole family walking and interacting and chatting. And I think this has uh, been a lesson. And you mentioned it, Austin. And we should slow down a little bit. We should enjoy our family. I never saw these families out walking together before the pandemic. And, 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 and kids, when we were growing up, Roddy and Peter and I, we were always outside inventing things to do. You, you mentioned uh, in some preliminary information you sent us about Creativity, how does creativity develop? Well, I think it develops from getting outside and playing without a lot of structured activity and inventing things outside. In my neighborhood, finally, the kids are out there playing. They're getting out, they're playing, and they're trying things to do instead of, I don't know what they're doing inside, but I have a feeling they're kind of inside locked into their social media and their internet and things like that. You might think there's more of that, and maybe there is, but I also see kids out and tennis courts, I lived close to some tennis courts, and they were deserted <laughs> for the past couple of years. Now you can barely, they're always full of people out uh, recreating and interacting and enjoying the outdoors. And so I think that's a lesson here for us, is that we need to recover some of those things that we're now inventing again or discovering again. And so I, good, so good, so good. Um, and actually, you just you just hit on the thing that I wanted to kind of end today's episode with, the idea that you talk about in the book that creativity and knowledge are two sides of the same coin. And this podcast being right-brained realism, the uh, the idea of creativity and analytical and knowledge and imagination, and um, and you guys put that point more beautifully in, uh, than, than I, I've been trying to kind of tell people what this show is and what it's about and um, the creativity and the analytical and you guys put it so much better than I can. So um, any or all of you, if you just kind of want to talk a little bit about how important creativity is to knowledge, because often we see creative over here and intellectual over here as separate pursuits and they're not. And uh, that's kind of what I want to end this episode with. If you guys want to just talk a little bit about that idea and the importance of, of both and how they inform each other and how they really are two sides of the same coin. Well, I can start. Um, we've been criticized by saying, oh, what you're doing with your book uh, and your techniques or your, you're teaching people, you're, uh, you know, you're getting them to remember bits of knowledge uh, of course, we don't think they're bits of knowledge, but what about creativity? Shouldn't kids be creative? And that's what's being fostered in school. But um, one thing we see in every domain is you can't be creative unless you know an awful lot. You've got to know what has already happened or been done in that domain, at least in intellectual circles, for you to create something. And so creativity is built on knowledge. You have to have a knowledge base before you can be creative. 
That's so good. Yeah, the the greatest guitar solo you've ever heard doesn't happen unless that guy knows a lot about has put a lot of time in hours and years in of of learning music theory and chord structure and and the dexterity and the practice and yeah we, we see those guitar solos as creative pursuits and they are and that's beautiful but that's such a great way to put it is creativity is is starts with with a base of knowledge and i, I love that peter remark i think creativity is a way also to expand your knowledge uh you uh get into something new you decide you're going to maybe take a continuing ed course, or you're just gonna read about it, or you're gonna go out to your workshop and give it a try, and you figure out what you don't know that you've got to learn. Maybe you can go online, uh, you can find someone who can teach you. So the process of, of creating and learning, are, as you say, are two sides of the same coin. I think you need to keep creativity in your life because that's what propels you forward. And gives you the yeah, satisfaction. Yeah, the satisfaction. Absolutely. I always like to say that creativity breeds creativity. So even if this idea doesn't work out, it might lead you to your next one. Um, but really, creativity breeds knowledge and knowledge breeds creativity and creativity breeds knowledge. And it really is building blocks on each other. And you take what you've learned and you try to apply it to a new idea or solve a problem or create something. And then either that works and that's amazing or it doesn't. And you've learned something and then you get to learn something new and create something new. And they really do just kind of snowball each other. And I think those are, are beautiful ideas. Mark, you want to bring us home on the idea of uh, right brain <laughs> well, realism it, and it, creativity and knowledge? Sure, sure. I'd, I'd like to pick up on a point that Roddy mentioned about how in education and many people feel that learning is cramming information in to your head, into your brain that's, uh, that's uh, presented by an external source. And there are a lot of views of learning that suggest that learning is more effective if, in fact, it is a creative enterprise. So the idea is we shouldn't be thinking about learning as cramming things in the kid's head. We should be thinking about learning as giving students opportunities to explore a domain, discover concepts from that domain, and then apply that those concepts. That's known as the learning cycle. Some people talk about this cycle exploration discovery application and some uh, curricula are designed around exactly that learning cycle and at the heart of it is creativity you're not telling somebody about a chemistry construct you're having them explore some sort of uh, a, a chart or uh, a, or a lab exercise and from that they're supposed to construct or create the knowledge that helps link these observations together. So in some sense, create, you could view creativity as the heart, as the foundation of learning in, in some sense, it, 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 if the format of instruction is pursued that way. Man, Mark, when I said, do you want to bring us home? I, I, I didn't even think you were going to do that like that. That was perfect. That was perfect. That was better than I could have imagined, better than I could have hoped for. Um, just that creativity is and can be, and in many ways should be, creativity is the heart of learning. Give the students the tools, give the students the, the building blocks for them not only to learn the information you're presenting there, but to build on that, create something new, retain and learn more and take it with them throughout their lives. Goodness gracious, guys, make it stick. The science of successful learning, a huge, huge heartfelt thanks, not just for writing the book and, and for me and for what I've learned from it, um, but, and for the time that they have they put in, the, the literally 95 years that these guys have spent collectively um, researching memory and, and knowledge and retention and, and Peter's life as a storyteller and how those things all came beautifully. So thank you for just the, the effort that you put in on this and thank you for, for taking the time uh, with me today. I In my email, I said, uh, would you mind spending an hour with me? And I, I've definitely taken more of your time than that today. So thank you for sticking with me. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. And to the listeners, to the watchers, I hope you have enjoyed this and learned something from this. Um, and you've gotten value today. I, I, I know that I have uh, just fantastic. Uh, guys, where can they find you? Uh, and again, I'll put all these links in the in the description and the uh, in the 
description, the link underneath the podcast and the video and everything. But where can they find you? Where can they find the book? Uh, and if they want to have you come speak, not just to teachers and not just to faculty, but if they want to have you come te- uh, speak to their students, uh, what's the best way for people to contact you guys? The website is called makeitstick.com. Make it stick is one strung together as one word dot com. There is a way to email the authors uh, at that website. And uh, if you're looking to buy a book, uh, that he won't have a problem finding it. I don't think uh, if your bookstore doesn't have it, uh, ask him to order it for you. Uh, all mm-hmm. the usual places uh, to get a book uh, can get uh, make it stick. Fantastic, guys. Makeitstick.com. Uh, reach out to these guys. Uh, have them come speak to you. Buy their book, and um, we'll all be better for it. Thank you, guys, again so much, and thank you. Thank you, Austin, for watching. Absolutely, guys. Thank you, Austin. Um, no, yeah, not at all. Pleasure, pleasure has been all mine, and I hope also the listeners. Uh, for those of you who stuck with us for the full uh, episode, I just want to thank you so much. I and uh, we'll see you next time on the next episode of Right Brain Realism. Uh, I'm Austin J. Morris. I want to say thank you again, and uh, let's remember to mix it up, to space it out, <laughs> and to test ourselves and and push ourselves to be better. And uh, let's try to be a little better tomorrow than we are today. Cheers.